Welcome to the Red Med Podcast, Rescue, Expedition and Disaster Medicine, where we provide a platform for healthcare professionals working in or aspiring to join rescue, expedition and disaster response teams, a platform to share information, advice and opportunities and connect like-minded Red Med individuals in our community. Welcome to episode 8 of the Red Med Podcast. As usual, I'm joined by our SOS crew chief, Chris Sharp. Afternoon, Chris. Good afternoon. This support podcast is supported by SOS Coffee, Guatemalan coffee that we sell locally and internationally to fund our medical missions for underserved communities and to deliver free CPR and bleeding control courses around the region. Following on from the last podcast, where we discussed some considerations for planning and execution of expeditions, whether it be jungle or, or mountain, we thought we'd have a, a bit of a coffee cake and cases session. So we sat here with a coffee, or in your case a cup of tea, some biscuits, and we just thought we'd bounce some ideas around about a recent case study where we applied those same principles to a jungle expedition. Albeit it was a, a short duration, it was in very deep, very remote jungle in challenging conditions without communications. So I hope the ideal to try and put all of those pre-planning considerations into, into context for you and talk about your your recent trip support the film crew. So do you want to give us a little bit of context as to what the job was in general first? The job was through the UK media company uh, as part of a National Geographic series that's ongoing. I'll not mention the name because I don't know if I'm allowed to. Uh, and they're filming the Mayan sites, not the normal ones like Mirador and Tikal, although they are will be filmed, but these are the ones that are actually more important historically than Mirador, believe it or not. Wow. Uh, and to give an idea of location, we flew from Guatemala commercial north for an hour to Flores Paten, then four by four, eight hours west across the country before we got into small boats and then we did four hours up the river on the border between Mexico and Guatemala to the fixed campsite and that's where we kind of day run out of uh, 12 hour days filming. We were actually in the camp only the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and we departed the Friday so time period it was very short but it's a week literally in the middle of nowhere. We were in a, it's a former jungle camp, uh, logging camp, that's now been converted into a ranger station, but it is, there is nothing up there for miles, uh, apart from... No uh, roads, no phone signals. Nothing. No uh, medical support. Just things that want to eat you. Interesting, yeah, there's all sorts up there. Okay, so it gives us a bit of context as to the, the recent case. If be good to break this down into phases so it links in with the last podcast. Once you got the initial request, or we at SOS got the initial request to support this TV crew, what research did you do and what sources did you look for information? Uh, to start with, I got I came in the office and they went, Sharp, you're going to Paten. <laughs> and I, as we all know, Paten is kind of a built-up city and it was like, okay. I was filming for National Geographic so it's not going to be in the city then. Uh, there was a couple of emails banded around between a, a fixer on location out here. And then finally I got put in touch with the production manager in the UK, which through phone calls and all that, is exactly what you do and where you're going. And the big problem we had initially were they were giving names like El Porvenir. There's nine of those in Guatemala. Yeah, that's true. It's which specific one? And because they wanted to then involve helicopters, and obviously we have the link with those, and it just saved language, is I need latitude and longitude. So we exactly know we're talking about the same place. Or if you've not got that exactly... At the same time as you're on the phone, let's look at Google Earth and we kind of 
walked the curses across while talking till we found exactly where we were going. Once I had that plan, I came in the office, swore at a few people, saying it's not as easy as just pretend. <laughs> it's deep in the jungle. Yeah. We then, I spoke to, just went to the Healy goes. I spoke to Max Baldetti because I obviously he does a lot of stuff in that region and he's done a lot of TV shows. And Neil Santos from Local Herpetologist. Yeah, who runs the Central Antivenom Network of what kind of terrain it is, the climate. There was a risk assessment from the UK, which was invariably wrong, even down to the weather this time of year. Uh, probably got from the CIA World Factbook. From my understanding, there was some information, whether it be the risk assessment or just general background information, from a local fixer, a local guy, who probably has never left Guatemala yeah. City, let alone being up yeah, there. Yeah, and it was good to cut him out of the equation because I've got nothing to do with him in part of our research. Yeah, we did correspond for other things, but like you say, he's probably never left the city, ever, or... Been down the beach, she was coming back. Well, that's made my day. <laughs> uh, so I spoke to the guys out on here, like Max, because he's done up there with all these various TV filming. Nils, who goes up there for snakes, because that's his job. So I got an idea of what animal threats were up there, the climate, the terrain. Yeah, at this point you will not get a phone signal, so I could start and generally form a plan. And the good thing about news companies, they produce, it's called a call sheet. It's got everybody's details, contact details, everything on it. It's got the filming schedule, the flight schedule. It tells you exactly what, it's like a daily orders in the military. That helped us plan everything yeah. from the communications and to the medical <clears throat> response to the pre-training. And that was the basis of what I planned around. Because I know on this day, yeah, I don't even know exactly the area you're going. There's very little information on it. It's like Macalero. Nobody's ever been there, mm. apart from the archaeologists that were taking. Uh, I tried contacting him, but he was coming off another project, flying from overseas. So... Yeah, the bits missing. But I took their call sheet, what I spoke with on the phone, the local advice, and that kind of gave me an overall umbrella picture of what we were doing. It was interesting to see it develop because I was on the fringes providing what, what support you needed from the outside. But the first conversation we had was, the area looks like somebody's dropped green paint on a piece of paper. <laughs> And over the next, the course of two or three days, as people added more fragments and snippets of information, the picture became clearer. We got better mapping, better idea yeah. of what was going on. Yeah, because if, even if you look on Piedras Negras, if you look on uh, Google Earth or any of those, it's just green yeah. with a river in it. No tracks. There's, there's nothing there. Uh, so it's then taking that. Uh, obviously, I've got the UK, they had their risk assessment. And then I added my own risks of local knowledge of this is the type of snake. They are quite mature in that area. The Ferdelances are a bit more angry because they're a bit older. There's crocodiles, there's monkeys. It's all there. Uh, from then, I did uh, a lot of research on the type of crocodile. How do they hunt? Because they're ambush predators. The snakes. I spoke to you quite a bit about snakes. Yeah. Uh, so I can generate in my own mind a risk assessment of the animals. Because everybody thinks snakes is the biggest killer, whereas we know actually in the jungle dehydration is the number one killer, followed by deadfall or bits of trees falling on you. And howler monkeys like throwing things at people underneath them. Yeah. Whether their own excrement or the nearest tree. Yeah, my hammock was cut <coughs> last time. Uh, so then that gives you a basis of the, 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 a lot of emails about anti venom and this misconception that we can just give it. But then you have to, I admit before, 
three weeks ago, I'd not done a lot on anti-venom for about a year, but then I spent four or five days talking to you, heads in books, latest research. I mean, that's a podcast in itself. It's Unless you've been in this environment before and had to rely on it and had to know it and carry it, the, the responsibility of carrying it, you wouldn't really know. You've got polyvalent, monovalent, second generation, third generation, initial dose, subsequent doses... Uh, polyvalent for the viper species, then for the, the corals and the lapids, etc. It's it's a huge field, isn't it? And and even on that, it was the the local fixer he had available a certain type, but it's it needs to be refrigerated. Yeah. And we're not carrying a fridge in the middle of the jungle. And it's all well and good saying we'll give it in hospital only. There's obviously a, a lot more opportunities to manage the risks and the potential complications of anti-venom in a hospital but if you're reined in the helicopter can't yeah. come and you're talking a two three day trek out the yeah. jungle and somebody's yeah. got a serious grade two grade three envenomation you haven't yeah. got that time in the hospital so it's all that and the in consultants from yourself and the sos medical director the, this is a list of drugs i want to take to manage what i perceive as the threats so at post research, you yeah. had the preparation yeah. phase, which included your drugs. Yeah. Uh, then you added some others in that I'd overlooked or not heard of, which then took me down another route of okay, I'm now going to take this drug. I think we considered yeah. it in three different ways that we yeah. looked at the primary care drugs for the everyday coughs, yeah. the sniffles, and grazes. Then you had the emergency yeah. drugs, the standard ACLS drugs. Yeah and then the specific to the environment yeah. drugs. Uh, and then, where necessary, training by yourself or the medical director on ones that I'd not used for a while, unfamiliar, or just as a refresher anyway. Yeah. Because uh, obviously a lot is in Spanish, really small Spanish, so you can't read it. So then that involves you then taking it away and labeling everything. I put everything in a Ziploc bag with a name in Spanish and in English, it's dose, so there was no, I didn't have to rummage around looking for different types of tablets that all look the same. In the dark with sweat in your eyes. Yeah. Uh, so the research, that kind of, and preparation, it kind of merged into, because then it was like, I now know where we're going, this is without looking at the Medivac plan, what am I gonna carry daily? Am I gonna do a fixed camp? all those considerations uh, because at the end of the day I'm still number one in the jungle I've got to carry the, my own personal gear in a rucksack so how big a rucksack am I taking there's tree foliage this time of year rain season there's a lot of dangly things I don't want a big rucksack so I took kind of a medium one framed unframed all that kind of arguments so I just basically took a soft one that I've used before, which prevented me from taking too much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, predominantly it was water, machete, uh, my head net, torches, batteries, my solar charger, uh, the hammock, a steel mug and a fire lighting kit. Dry kit. Uh, the dry kit, I didn't take daily. Normally I would take dry kit and my burger and then but because I left a hammock permanently at the camp, my dry kit stayed there. So if, because we were doing 12-hour days, if I'd have been wet overnight, it'd have been for one night yeah. as we rained in. So and I'd have probably been not sleeping anyway because it meant I'd have had a patient. Well, the dry kit on the the route in by yeah. the canoe, presumably it was double-bagged. Uh, canoe bags, bags. everything. Uh, inside a big mountain equipment bag, the main med bag that I left in the camp, that was in a, all bagged up and sealed. But I told everybody, obviously we took four boats, long little wooden boats with motors on. The main med bag, it got put with all the other luggage, but then I put it in our boat and they're like, why is your personal gear? I said, because the big med bag's in this one. Because if I get injured, at least you know where it is. Or, because yeah. we had to, decamp people from one boat to another to get over rapids so everybody knew where it was at all times and that preparation of how you're going to operate daily to achieve the mission of filming which 
I've never been on a filming mission on the ground. I've done it from helicopters where they just turn up and do what they want. So it was a whole new experience. I asked a couple of guys in the UK, I know, uh, how do you work? Because there is a protocol around cameras where you can stand, where you can speak, because noise, because they record everything. Got a bit of advice, a couple of an acronyms that they're likely to use, like point of view and all that kind of stuff. Just had a little idea of what to expect. Yeah. Part of that with them was I also sorted most of the not the helicopter route out and all that kind of thing, but could it actually get there? What was the weight limit by talking to the pilots just because of the language issue and to cut any confusion out so that we knew on this day the helicopter would be there. We changed the plan slightly because they would have been there at like four hours before us and they delayed until we arrived so that they could actually immediately start filming with all the gear there rather than be sat there in the middle of the jungle with a helicopter getting hot and bitten. So they kind of, we, while we had signal, we updated people as we went along. But the research was pretty much two weeks, week and a half, which also led into when I went the pre-deployment training that I did uh, using that the research phase on that pre-deployment and then amending my plan as I went along I was only local in the jungles around with my hammock, sleeping overnight, that kind of thing. Just making sure I had enough to be comfortable. Yeah. And whilst running through from the risk thing, could I manage a crocodile bite now? Have I got a taconica? They've got lots of teeth. I may have a pneumothorax. Can I manage a decompression? Yeah. Have you got something to yeah. improvise a chest seal? Uh, somebody's dehydrated. Can I IV? If it's a hard IV, I didn't take IO with me. I took the TAC Med Super Spring Boa Constrictor. I had one of those. Uh, what size cannulas to take? How many? What size saline bags? And pared it down to literally a multifunctional. I can manage everything from a crocodile bite to dehydration. Yeah. With a few pills like loratadine, antihistamines, that kind of thing. Uh, I think we bored and blasted several scenarios, yeah. didn't we? This might happen, what are you going to do? Where do you need to move to? Have you got the kit to deal with this? If not, how can you improvise? Yeah. Or do you need to take it? We bored and blast lots of scenarios. And, and I, I kind of planned on, and it's probably come up in a minute, I kind of went bare minimum, not bare minimum, comfortable minimum through the day with a big med bag back at the camp. Because the, the medevac, the immediate area medevac was we need we needed to get back to that camp anyway. Or if I was in a position in the jungle where I couldn't move the patient, I had enough to stabilise and treat while the boat went back yeah. and brought the big bag because everybody knew where it was. It was kept in the same place every day taped above it was the number of the helicopter pilot and helicopters to Guatemala because pretty much they were the only people who would be able to get to us in an emergency and the pilot was sat in Paten an hour away just waiting in case we had an emergency so that was taped there so everybody knew where the sat phones were everybody knew how to operate them so they knew where the bag was they could call so at least the medevac plan would be and I'd spoke, I'd spoke to the pilot he knew if he got this call he, I gave him like a simple list of I need you to call like Chris Gibson SOS so at least the message is out there that there is an issue uh, and it can start rolling in the background yeah. which we can turn off if we need to uh, so doing the research allows you to plan but then the plan needs to be cascaded and people yeah. need to understand it and know how to implement it in context yeah. uh, yeah, it's, no, it's not a plan if you don't share it. Yeah. Uh, and that, that research, the pre-deployment, yeah, part of fitness, acclimatisation, because it was a lot. We were on 98% humidity where we were. It was 34 degrees. On the preparation side, what, what did you do in terms of PPE, personal protective equipment for you? Uh, <coughs> for me... Uh, Notwithstanding my like day burger, 
I wore Jungle Boots. Uh, the reason I did that week in the hill is because they were new. The traditional, I noticed the camera crews, they've got a, like a UK version of a jungle boot that look really expensive, really nice, but the sole is a vibrant. Mm. If we'd have gone up the hill in the mud, they, would, they wouldn't have been able to go up. Whereas the traditional jungle boot, think of Vietnam films, have got a really aggressive tread pattern. Yeah. Uh, so I wore jungle boots, socks, brand new, uh, with a high lycra content. I use brand new so that they've still got that kind of lycra tightness. You adopt to the shape yeah. of your foot instead of sagging and yeah. causing blisters. Rolling up under your toes. Uh, I have these crack hopper trousers, just lightweight as these crack hoppers, Columbia, whatever mate they are. Do you wear shorts or long trousers? Long trousers. Uh, long trousers all the time. Uh, lycra cycling shorts. That's from the Belize days, I think. Uh, just because it stops chafing and stops the friction and the chafing yeah. and then you get infected and uh, so this time I I wore the I don't normally like these belts that come with your lightweight walking trousers but I wore it this time just because it stops rubbing on your waist as much but then I had a long sleeve shirt all the time it's a Columbia Magellan one of those kind of ones but the one I've got is a size too big or it might even be two sizes too big. So when I've stood with it on it, literally the, the bottom of the shirt comes to my knees. Because when it's tucked in my trousers then, at no stage does it come untucked. When, if I bend down, it yeah. doesn't reveal my backside like a builder. Or show any flesh yeah. for the mozzies. So it's that much bigger, but because it's permanently wet, it kind of, it's easier to move. Uh, then I've got like a sweat rag, which is literally an old t-shirt, just cut into a strip, tied in a knot round my neck just for wiping sweat. Bush hat, my machete, uh, that's tied with paracord, that lived on me all the time, never comes off. Uh, I was kind of, and I've got a pair of gloves and a head net. The only things I carry in my pocket was in my right cargo leg pocket was my head net and uh, I've got a pair of like light pilot type leather gloves just for when you sat around just to stop spiny insects plants all kinds of things and that was like my wet kit which I wore the same every day and I did advise everybody I would be wearing the same clothes every day I'm gonna smell yeah but I'll be comfortable at night yeah because I wear wet during the day because they were all like north face jackets when it was raining and now they're too hot and they're feeling dizzy. I'm just wet and then when it stopped raining, I'm dry again. And I'm cooled down as well because obviously you can't. You don't sweat because of the humidity, you don't evaporate. So yeah, you get wet. There's nothing in my pockets that will get damaged. Except you're gonna be wet all day and then put your nice comfy clothes on in the hammock. And yeah, and at night it's just you've got dry kit to put on. I wore I've got a pair of old socks from the UK, a thick like woolen hiking socks, a pair of like Toweling, jogging, sweatpants, and a long sleeve jumper thing, which I wear at night. Tuck my feet up. Uh, a pair of Crocs or a pair of flip flops just for my feet. To air them off, but yeah, not then, to walk around with the dark. And then wring your wet stuff out, wash it if you want, hang it up. It can be emotional in the morning when you put it back on. But when uh, Max and I were up in the jungle teaching the wilderness first aid course to the guides, we did the same routine, employed the same routine. But instead of hanging our clothes up in the tree, we hung them up in uh, in our boot pro bags, which we designed and we've got patented now, or the patents in the process. Just a mesh bag, which you can use as a water filler, but you can also put your boots in, seal them up at night, or put your wet clothes in so they can dry. So the next morning, you're not putting your foot or your hand into this dark, unknown crevice yeah. where there might be spiders, snakes, and scorpions. And that, from a psychological standpoint, gave us so much more confidence and took the stress away. We were finding tarantulas the size of your hands, in people's shirts, on top of people's boots, scorpions, and to have all of your kit that's not inside your zipped up hammock, but inside these these bags, it means you can safely, with confidence, touch your kit, put your clothes back I think one of the first WhatsApps I sent you after we got back into Signal, and I'd said, we've done a medivac, blah, 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 
was, do you still do boot safes? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I've got one here in the room. <laughs> and you sent me a photo of it. You just forgot like, to take it. I need that. <laughs> I need that so much. Uh, Lessons learned. Yeah, so kit, and then I just took a... a I travelled in a smart set, just like a polo shirt, because I was meeting clients for the first time, rather than I'm turning up as crocodile Dundee. So when you turned up and you met them, the meet and greet... You probably got a better idea of individual perspectives and objectives. Each department has their own ideas. You probably got a better idea of the plan. Were you able to adapt your plans and your equipment, or did you have to change anything, or did they change based on your advice? It was. It was. I was fortunate. We flew. I flew up with the assistant producer and the in-country fixer. Uh, she was very experienced. She'd done James Bond Spectre. She's a really well known. Uh, we literally met on the plane because so I introduced myself to some four people at the airport that wasn't them. Like, they looked the part. Yeah, two European girls, a European bloke, and uh, a Mexican looking, looked like an archaeologist. And it wasn't them, it was the people I didn't notice. Uh, I flew up with the producer. I knew his camera crew because he had a big day sack full of lithium batteries because obviously you have to fly on the plane with them. That he nearly dropped on my feet. So for the hour flight up, he kind of told me what they wanted to do, what the plan was, because obviously we met the presenter, the camera crew, the, the producer and the sound they flew in. He told me any specific concerns that he'd heard, separate to what I'd investigated. Like there was a big case, not more so the locals. They or there'd been a camp before, and people like get up in the middle of the night to get the toilet without a head torch in the flip flops, and the further lances are abundant at night. Yeah, they are. Yes, they're dangerous. They're not the most dangerous, but they're more dangerous in, because they just attack you. And I think in my safety brief I did later was I described them as Scotsmen with a hangover looking for more whiskey. <laughs> Which kind of got with everybody. Good one. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, so, it was all the other So then I, that amended the brief that I gave the team once there. Uh, we talked about Medivac with a fixer. We talked about the local hospitals. They asked me, because they'd been saying, this hospital's got an A&E, and I went, there's more gear in my bag than in that hospital. Guaranteed, yeah. Or, have you thought about this hospital? And I walked them through the medical evacuation plan on why I'd done it, so that they were all happy. Uh, these were the routes we're doing, okay. Uh, another podcast was about responsibility. Who am I looking after? Yeah, I remember you saying, yeah. Uh, I know there's the production crew, but now I find there's like 10 other locals, which are porters, boat drivers, all that kind of thing. Am I looking after them as well? Because I don't have that much. I've got enough to stabilise and cover most things. But and in the end, were you responsible for them? I mean, from an ethical point of standpoint. Ethically, yeah. yes. They said, yes, we would like to because obviously we're paying them so they're effectively staff yeah. however it's up to you uh, so firmly the decisions are yours <laughs> they're part of the team at the end of the yeah. day so uh, it's important that you take that into account in terms of quantities and medications and pre-existing yeah, conditions and if you've got but the they appreciated the question because they have done film shoots where they do use locals and they're not responsible at all for them and the medic has specifically said, no, you're here for the production crew only. Yeah. Uh, but because we were so remote, they went, we would, we would like you to look after everybody. So given the environmental risks, the humidity, dead force, snakes, spiders, scorpions, the water hazards, the activity you were doing, the different types yeah. of people, different cultures and background, age ranges... Did you do a daily safety brief or a, a pre-deployment camp routine brief? We basically, there was myself, the assistant producer, the fixer, the archaeologist and another, like the Guatemalan project manager. 
we stayed in the hotel the first night and then drove eight hours across Guatemala and then four hours upriver in the boat. <clears throat> then that afternoon met the production crew, the presenter, the producer, the cameraman, the sound. They, they flew in by helicopter and pretty much because of the time of the day and the weather, they went straight into filming because we took the rest of the gear. So there was no real time. We'd already talked about it because we stayed in the same hotel, had dinner together. So we pretty much went straight into filming. Uh, the helicopter shoots and all that kind of thing. It wasn't until the evening. And it was quite difficult because their priority is charging batteries ready for tomorrow. Mm. The, we had a generator which operated three, three and a half hours every night solely to charge camera batteries. If you wanted your phone charging, you kind of had to wait, yeah. So they, they've got a really switched on, swept up routine in, batteries on charge, sort out kit, get everything ready. Uh, the assistant producer downloads everything onto about seven different hard drives, labels everything, clears all the memory cards so they can use tomorrow. So instead of becoming a drain on the main effort and the central resources, were you self-sufficient in terms of providing charging capabilities for your own comms and your own medical Yeah, I, I had uh, <clears throat> a couple of those cheap battery packs, and then I charged them through the day from a solar monkey uh, panel. Mm -hmm. I, there was another plug I did use one night, but pretty much I charged my batteries through the day which then charged my phone overnight. So I, panel on the yeah, I was side. independent. Occasionally, if there's a plug spare, I'd chuck it in just to give it a top up. This was before my phone succumbed to the jungle. Uh, but yeah, I, I was totally self sufficient in every way to what they were doing. It wasn't until then, and then pretty much I had to rein people in because they wanted to eat, they'd just travelled from Europe, etc. Right, fellas, sit down, shut up. This is a site, site safety brief. Uh, environment, personnel, activity, that kind of thing. Risks in the camp. Your biggest risks are. I do, this is and I had my day sack on the table. This is what I'm carrying through the day. But this is where the other med bag is. Look here, it's all labelled. This is where it's located. It will be there all the time. Please don't use it because time comes and I took a small first aid kit just a $10 one from the store for them for plasters and paracetamol I went that one you can use just let me know you use it because then I can restock it but the first aid kit anybody can use the other one you won't know what's in there I've got chest tubes I've got sutures I've got everything to stabilise you and if you use a suture to fix your pack frame and I need to do a chest tube you've just totally ruined my day uh, then we put the emergency number above that just a sharpie pen, piece of paper, gaffer tape to the wall and that's where the med bag stayed yeah. did the safety brief they all wore snake gaiters some of the camera crew, I know we talked about it they wore wellingtons pretty much because they stood still stood in boggy yeah, ground they, in the water all day wherever the shot is they stand yeah. and they don't move so they've got reduced circulation. Uh, so I did a bit about risks of... <clears throat> they're like, are you wearing snake gaiters? I went, no, because I've got all you people in front of me. Uh, you'll, you'll scare it, you'll get bitten, and I'm okay because I'm near the back. Uh, they, were, they, they had to wear snake gaiters. <clears throat> uh, they took Wellingtons. Uh, some guys wore them, some didn't. Uh, the first shoot we did was a four hour uphill trek through the jungle uh, to a mine site. You couldn't have done that in Wellingtons. Well, you could have done, but your feet wouldn't have thanked yeah. you for it. <clears throat> but so, they're, they're useful for, I know it's not a cold environment, but it's useful for preventing things like trench foot, where you've got reduced circulation and you're wet and yeah. cold all, all day. And, and it, it's quite an interesting, why you got Wellingtons? I and mean, it's because with camera, wherever we stop to get that specific shot, that's where we stop until we can move if that's eight hours they stay there yeah. for eight hours well, once you get wet feet and you're static all day if your feet are wet like that for two or three days you'll be in the right state uh, we then they sorted out who was sick they all had pop up tents 
because there are some buildings that you can go in or a bed with a mosquito net a couple of them had tents uh, me and the assistant producer we had hammocks and because the forecast was rain in the rainforest a couple of guys were like where, where's the best place to put tents so they instantly looked at me where do we put a tent and that's kind of where you have to dive all from your stereotypical medic to well I won't go here because there's mud everywhere but if you look where the helicopter was it's nice less grass but if you look there there's kind of an angle yep. and it all runs down there and it's just interpreting the lie of the land they put the tents there I had no problem with water they had a few tarantulas crying up between the fly sheet and the outer sheet a lot of frogs jumping around and amphibian types a lot of considerations that there's the deadfall yeah. if you pitch your tent right next to a track that's probably where the snake's going to bask in the early morning yeah. sun to and it was, it was just looking at the site where safe in my opinion well I would go there I don't know about you fellas but this is where I put my tent did you talk about camp hygiene routines and discipline yeah, we, had the, we had the fortune that there be the ranger station it's got uh, flushing toilets and cold showers if you don't mind really big spiders uh, we had hand gel, so we covered camp hygiene. The main thrust of that brief was, because everyone thinks they're going to die by snake bite, mm. is it was like a welcome, a bit of my background, because none of them had never met me, a bit of my background, what we do in Guatemala, helicopters, survival, all that kind of thing, to put them at ease. Uh, PPE and... Pretty much it was all about prevention. Uh, this is what you're going to come across. Let's allay fears, and I'll quite bluntly, your biggest killer is going to be dehydration. How you prevent dehydration, yeah. sunburn, sunburn, mosquito bites. Mosquito bites, Blisters. wash your hands, stomach upsets. Do all the, let's, we can eradicate 90% by you washing your hands. Mm. Uh, and a bit of a field lecture like that. I've got diarolite. We're, we're taking water every day. They did take... Basically, everyone was responsible for their own water, and they took, you know, the ceramic eco-filters? Yeah. Uh, because, obviously, the water comes from either the rain or the river. Uh, so that's what we used for drinking water. And then we had, at lunchtime, like a little pack lunch with a Gatorade or an orange juice, something different to water... Uh, snacks uh, that kind of thing <clears throat> some nicest chocolate I've had in Guatemala I can't remember the name uh, so a lot of that the emphasis on the safety brief was prevention uh, if you want to do, not not get bitten by a snake in the middle of the night put something on your check your footwear first put it on your feet use your torch I know it's a bit of a rigmarole that the toilet's only three metres away but there's a nice bit of warm ground there where Mr. Snake wants to be. Yeah. Uh, step on logs, not over logs. And it was all more of a prevention. Uh, and then I kind of ended it with, where do you want... I did a daily sit parade. I said, every morning, uh, basically we, we were up at... Got up about 5 a.m., breakfast 5.36, because as soon as the light was out we were gone for a moment so I said every morning whilst breakfast is on anybody get problems blisters feet crotch rot I don't care what it is let me know that's really important that you make yourself available so people know you're approachable you're open they know where to find you at what time so there's no barrier there if they feel they can't come to you or they don't know where yeah. all of a sudden you're in the middle of the jungle or on top of a mountain oh, I would have told you but I couldn't find you and yeah. now you've got a problem in a remote yeah. area and it was so I had a fixed because basically we had a, a central table under a hut and that's where the generator was I said I will be here from this time at night and the same time in the morning every day if you've got anything what, no matter how trivial let me know we can have a look even if it's lots of insect bites, we can clean them, prevent them being septic. At night time, because it gets dark at 5.30, so you've got 5.30 till 5 a.m. It's pitch black. I'm in my hammock because there's nothing else to do. 
Uh, if you need me at the night, just come wake me up. However, when we're filming through the day, obviously you're off filming here. We're kind of at the back with the gear out of the way. You'll have to come and find me. If you go five miles ahead, I'll be five miles behind unless you yeah. let us know. Uh, and then it was more of, and your expectations of me are what? What do you think I'm going to do for you? And we, we talked about snake venom and all these kind of things, and I kind of explained it doesn't actually work like that, which we'll cover in a separate podcast, yeah. which is a shock to a lot of people. Uh, like the archaeologist, he carries it. He doesn't know how to do it yeah. or how to use it, he but they carry it. Cure for yeah, let's wave it in the air and we're all better. Yeah. Uh, a bit about medevac, a bit about comms, uh, all that kind of thing. So it was kind of a compre. It wasn't very long, and it was more of like a chat with a few bullet points. It's a, a lot of it's about managing expectations. Yeah. You think I'm here for this? I'm actually here for this. Yeah. I think you're going to do this, but really yeah. you're going to be doing this. So as long as you manage expectations, and everybody understands their roles and responsibilities where they should be, what we can actually yeah. do, and what we need to yeah. improvise or talk and about it, later. And also it was. If I'm doing something wrong as a medic for your, tell me. If I'm stood in the wrong place, I said, just tell me. Yeah. I said, because I've done filming from helicopters, blah, 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 blah. I've never been on the ground with you. If you want me to stand in a certain location or... Because you end up carrying camera kit. Everybody carries camera kit. Uh, but I said, I'll only carry it for a certain because at the end of the day... If I'm starting to get tired, everyone else is starting to get tired, and quite selfishly, that's the point I need to lighten my load because that's when accidents will happen. Or you're gonna, it's going to affect your decision. Yeah. Making it capable of it. Hot as hell, etc. Uh, so speaking of the heat, you, once you got into the routine, you'd established the parameters and the rules. You kind of followed their rules. They, they followed your health and safety advice. So you got into the daily routine. I understand there was a helicopter in, or fixed wing first, <coughs> helicopter, ground transport, canoe, the Mark One boot, until you got into the really remote area. You gave the prevention brief, you were alongside them all the time. Then the heat kicked in, you got into the real austere yeah. remote environment where there's no telephone signal. I'm reading your debrief, you had three patients, right? Yeah. Uh, the first one was on day one, which was the cameraman. He basically, they were filming doors off on the helicopter. He put, because of the camera, he was on headset, but then he'd taken the headset off because he changed camera or whatever he's doing. So basically, he'd put a paper serviette in his ear. And it, it, when he pulled it out, he was sat at lunch at night. Something wrong with my ear. I think I've got a bit of paper. And he literally, one ear was plugged up. Uh, so that was just simple head torch, pair of forceps. Because well, if you don't take forceps or tweezers, uh, or even nail clippers for those annoying little bits of skin. Yeah. Uh, so that was quite an easy removal. The second, uh, the presenter, obviously he's got a prosthetic limb. That wasn't really my concern because looking at his activities, what he's done before, he is an adventure presenter, uh, explorer, that kind of tomb raider, that kind of thing. So he can manage phantom limb pain, etc. But he gets problems. He had like a little trifold seat, which I was kind of jealous of in the end because he could sit down without sitting in the jungle. Uh, he'd deal with his phantom leg pain, all that kind of stuff. But with him stood, when they do take after take after take after take, he started to get like spinal pain, lower back pain, which normally you'd probably say, go to bed, you'd be fine. But because it was making him grimace with pain on camera, mm. it was like, how to, to affect the main effort yeah and it's now affecting and he's not smiling when he should be smiling or talking because his back hurts so literally that was I get, I said these are what I've got I've got tablets for this 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 however I think for you I gave him a diplophanic intramuscular I said it's a bit stronger 
it works more deep muscle and it'll be the difference between waiting 30 minutes for a tablet to start to come into effect or 15 minutes I am uh, which at the end of the day is film time, light time. So I gave him that. He never had dick on that before, I don't think. And um, back pain went. Felt yeah. awesome. Carry on normal jogging. Yeah, carry on. No problems. And then the last one, uh, the Thursday we left at 6.30 a.m. And one of the, the guys had said, I think the, the chef isn't feeling very well which always stops the alarm bells ringing, is if she's not feeling well, we're all we're going to die later on. <laughs> and I was like, do you know what it is? But we were already going down the river in the boats. Uh, and it's like, she feels nausea, stomach pain, something. And I was like, okay. Uh, we returned at 5.30 at night. And it's all like, doctor, doctor. So I just let them call me doctor. <laughs> just not to upset them. Uh, and she had an acute abdomen uh, upper central quadrant spasms of pain through my uh, old Red Cross picture book and the, the one baker scale pain scale yeah she was off the charts only when it spasmed mm. uh, when it relaxed she was alright she just felt nauseous so then it was <clears throat> how serious is she because now all the production crew are kind of start to panic because she, she wasn't well. Uh, she'd been laid in a hammock for a while. She was 35 years old, rotund, to put it politely. A uh, lot of tissue fat. So I said, right, let's get her out of this hammock for a start because it's a string hammock and I can't do anything when she's in a hammock. I did her vital signs of blood pressure. She, had, she was high. She was 170 over 110, pretty much. She'd had dengue, the blood sugars were fine, all that kind of thing. So we moved uh, into the tent which was inside the building. Uh, I gave her Nazol, which is the local version of antiemetic, antiemetic, just to kind of sort that. Uh, and I tried initially, I did a ranitidine for the stomach because it was, she couldn't really locate the pain. She just said it was about a nine and a ten. Uh, but as soon as she tried that, she nearly vomited it up, so she spat them out. So it was like, okay. I then gave, because she said it's spasming through the pre research with the med director. I gave the two ampules. <coughs> I'm not going to try to pr pronounce the name. That was a local trade name. Yeah. Antispasmonic. Uh, antispasmonic. Which kind of... I gave that IM. Which started to work. Uh, and it eased up pain within 20 minutes. But then, very quickly, it came back. So then it was like, we've done IMs. I'm going to have to go IV. <clears throat> Anybody who's ever done an IV in a clinic, back of the ambulance, the street, they can be easy, they can be hard. I had a rotund lady in the middle of the night, candle, mosquitoes. Uh, I went simple, I went 18 gauge. ACF. ACF. Sweat uh, dripping in your eyes. I couldn't palpate vein, I couldn't see it, it's just like you've always said, it's there. Trust, Trust yourself, it. yeah. Uh, 18 gauge in, a little bit of a wiggle and then that, oh, there's a flash. Uh, but then that just opens up so many more options. Uh, so I secured that, just put a head lock on while I kind of decided what am I doing next. And then with a the pain, uh, Part of my prolonged package was tramadol. It's not my most favourite drug, uh, but it's easy for transportation through airports than fentanyl or control, that kind of thing. It's, it's a lot easier to move around Guatemala with it, yeah. Uh, so now I had IV, I gave her another nausea because she wasn't still actively... She, everyone's saying she was sick, but it was a case of head in the black bag. 
it was just saliva and bar. She wasn't actually vomit. Uh, so I gave her another nausea. <clears throat> then I went by this stage. <clears throat> I'm assuming it's dark. It's by pitch now. black. And your only way out was a jungle trek and then a, a canoe trip. Yeah. Down I, the I've just done a 14 hour day. So, irrespective of how bad she is, you're staying there. Yeah. And then I ain't going anywhere. We ain't going anywhere. Uh, the, the fixer, the production, the producer, very quickly, what do you want? Because she was white as a ghost that you could see in the middle of the night. Do we need the helicopter to come early in the morning because it was due at eight? And I went, well, it's not coming anyway because we're now in the middle of a tropical thunderstorm. We're going to have clouds. We can take a boat. And I went, the risk of a boat trip. The boat drivers are happy to do it, but it is very... It's a chance of capsizing And it's that, is it life-threatening, yes or no? To me, no, I can... It possibly, possibly is life-threatening, but I can manage... Now, I mean, we're talking to healthcare professionals on, on this podcast, and so we don't need to go into yeah. the, the differentials for acute abdomen. There were loads from appendicitis, cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, possibly even uh, even heart problems with the yeah. epigastric pain. But her BP was fine. Yeah, right. She certainly wasn't hypotensive. Yeah. And it's, I created uh, in my notebook uh, a vital signs chart, uh, which you can see here. Twenty-four hour prolonged field yeah. care chart, and. So the, the producers do we need to medevac, and it's having that confidence of going, I can actually manage this. Yeah. Inwardly, I wasn't even at the stage of crying. I was because I had been bitten 192 times. I've got sweat. I'm now borrowed somebody else's head torch because mine's just gone flat. I've got a candle, one of those anti-mosquito coil things blowing smoke, so that's horrendous to try and breathe in. So put on... Uh, like a loading dose of tramadol then, tramadol through IV and uh, normal saline. And then it was, yeah, now we'll go in the morning when it's safe. If it was life-threatening, I'd say, yeah, I'm prepared to risk. Let's go in the boat and go now. It's a real balance, isn't it? If yeah. you had to capsize that canoe at night. I, yeah, I may change, with crocodiles, yeah. Mm. I may change my mind in three hours, but I said, I've done... Give me a couple of hours, I said, so I can see what our vital signs are doing. Look at the trend. I've got a baseline, I know what's happening. Yeah, she's stable. Yes, yeah, some things are high, something, but she's stable. Uh, and then it was, the, as we talked about after, the vital signs. Yeah, do I do them every hour? But at the end of the day, I've just done 14 hours. I'm tired anyway. I'm dehydrated, so I need to sort myself out. Plus, I've still got to operate the next day. And you didn't have a phone signal for no. med direction at the time, No. We had, they had sat phones and in-reach, which we'll cover in a minute. If it had been a true emergency, I would. But to me, it was, yeah, it's a cute abdomen, but it's not worth waking anybody up over yeah. at the minute. Yeah. The option's there, the option's available to me, but to everyone else, it's an emergency. To me, it's just an IV by candlelight and a bit of pain management. So you you survived the night. Um, yeah, I switched, to, uh, I switched to vital signs every three hours because I've still got a boat many back in the morning. We ultimately said, there's a smaller boat. Instead of taking four hours, we can do it in two. She might not be very comfortable, but then we put her into her local village, which has got a connected source to Mexico, which is just an hour's drive over the river. Or we can fly her out back to Paten, but then that puts a poor lady at the other side of the country to where she lives with nothing and no way of getting back. So it was that kind of... Again, where does your, yeah. Where are the parameters of responsibility? And then you're still going to film in the jungle and I'm not there. So if you do now get snake bitten, so there's that kind of management. Whereas how we did it was the... Basically, all the boats left at the same time <clears throat> and left three or four guys to wait for the helicopter to do the filming with the archaeologist who's <clears throat> he's worked there for the past four years, knows all the people. Uh, not ideal, but I took the main group with me. <clears throat> so if anything serious did happen to us, they've got like a basic trauma kit, that kind of thing. 
I know that in 30 minutes the helicopters are going to be there. If there's a problem, they're going to be in the city in a mm-hmm. 45 minutes. Whereas we've still got, I've got two hours on the river, the other boat's got four hours. Uh, so it's kind of that logistics movement of people to mitigate the risk to the majority. And then you know, the one or two, they need to stay and do this. Yeah. But they were in the HLS, which was cut short. The sun was out. They've got a local guy with them. Yeah, it's just it's as safe as you can be. Uh, so it was, it was interesting. It really tested. It didn't really test the medevac plan because the medevac plan didn't include, because at the time, I didn't know there was a little clinic that's got a partner agreement. You don't need a passport because it's the border villages, the frontier villages. They just drive you across. Uh, so the medivac plan, which you'd pre-prepared, discussed, rehearsed your scenarios, was robust and would have worked, but then this other option presented itself, mid-evacuation, yeah. and it was probably yeah. more efficient, more yeah. effective. Yeah, more the effective. And so the, the medivac plan we'd done was to get the production crew to the hospital in the city. Yeah. It didn't take into account locals. Because if we'd have now flown a 35-year-old from La Technica to so Central just, Medico... It's gonna, you're going to get a huge bill, but aside from that, if it's covered insurance, you've got to then get them back yeah, to Yeah, how's she going to get them? <laughs> Without walking. Uh, so, looking at that then, you had <coughs> potential acute abdomen, a little bit of immediate care, a bit of prolonged care because of the field conditions, etc., your medical emergency response plan changed, which can sometimes put people on the back foot and you start to panic, but you kept your composure. Um, looking at your planning and preparation and how you executed it, what worked for you, what didn't work, and what lessons did you learn? What worked was <clears throat> that week's pre-deployment, getting exactly the kit I needed for day, day-to-day running with a large central pack with pretty much a mini hospital in it, uh, which I used a lot of for this lady. That worked really well. Comms was a big issue. Uh, We did have comms, and for those listening, it's not like we had zero comms. The camera crews, they've got satellite phones, and a system, obviously, we've not heard of in Guatemala was inReach, which is basically, it's a handheld GPS, as we know GPSs, that you can marry to your phone so you can send two-way text messages, which was awesome. And that actually worked better than the sat phones. The sat phones really struggle when the rain come in or with a high tree canopy Yeah, yeah. for the little antenna, whereas the, the handheld GPSs, they just had signal all the time. Uh, the producers, I'm like, how are you texting? He went, oh, it's in reach. And I was like, what's in reach? And he showed me. Whereas the satellite phone, they'd have to go stand on the riverbank down in Crocodile Territory to get a signal. Get a clear sky. Yeah. Uh, so the comms was an issue. <coughs> Charging, yeah, totally independent of what they were doing. Lessons learned. I would take, in future, a really large mosquito net. If I'd have had to do the same procedure with that woman in the middle of the jungle, it's not an issue. I'd just be even more eaten alive. And I know on the mountain we use the the body bags and all that kind of stuff. We'd have died. Like, we'd have boiled inside that. But draping a large, like, four-person, two-person, double-bed-sized mosquito net would have given us a safe environment to work in protected from all the bitey things that are flying. Yeah, you've still got spiders and stuff yeah. on the floor, but 90% of the things fly at you. It's all well and good having the integrated mosquito in, it, in your hammock, but you have to break the yeah. continuity that every time you want to do vital signs yeah. or do an intervention. And so wherever they are on the floor, we could have protected as best as we can from the ground or even just scraped the foliage away to clear away. But then we could have put a mosquito net up just so you can operate even when we were sat while they're filming, you just got eaten. And I had my head net, which was a godsend. I, I, I've taken it a few times and I've always been a bit, I'm not wearing that. Yeah. Yeah. But I was straight on my head net, 
and it's literally it's the first time my head's not been bitten. I'm my head now, my gloves on. Everybody's looking at me as I go getting bitten, and I'm like, I'm fine. Uh, so yeah, the lessons learned was that communications. I would probably review this case again with the medical director and things to a more prolonged field care pain management. <clears throat> Tramadol just didn't fit. I know you'll never get the perfect, but it was just with it being nauseous already. Then we've got a boat ride with more nausea. It was just it's easy to travel with, it worked, but is there something better? If there isn't. Yeah, longer term. Yeah. Is there something maybe with less side effects that's a bit more hard hitting? I did have ketamine and like if the river was really high really high uh, normally when it's it's normal run level there are some proper like max loves kind of rapids and I would have probably had to almost ketamine on every rapid to get her through she was in pain just with the boat doing normal boat things mm-hmm. uh, if we'd have done anything more aggressive I'd have had to up the level so it's carrying the, the day drugs I just use like an old sunglasses case with foam on it with the amps in I had my epinephrine for anaphylaxis, uh, tramadol, antiemetics, ketamine. Uh, what crazy cholesterol? Yeah, pretty much enough to get you out, or at least stabilise you enough to get you out, or while the big bag comes with all everything else in. So that kind of systems approach really, really worked, and it allowed me to carry things like water so that I didn't die and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's got to be a balanced yeah. approach, hasn't it? And, and what really worked was, to be honest, the, the planning and involving people like yourself, the medical director, Nils, Max, get all that advice, write it all down, make sense of it, and use that expertise to formulate a plan. And not have an ego and think you yeah. know everything. Yeah, so I, I said to you, mate, I, don't, I can't remember anything about Snake Runner. So we've got it, what generation is it, blah, 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 blah. Can we, we've got this type already but no they're going to pay for this type but do we need a fridge and just having no ego yeah. absorbing the information but then it's what to do but then this, disseminating it after this is the problem yeah. this is the team solution and then as you say not having any ego and to provide institutional learning do a debrief for the med director the ops manager yeah. the helicopter crews and right this is what we learned from start to finish this yeah. worked, this didn't work. If this had happened, this wouldn't have worked. It, it's even with a, this female patient. At no stage, everyone else was panicking and flapping. At no stage did I feel out of my depth. Uh, it was, apart from the IV, which was really interesting, <laughs> with candles and mosquitoes and no palpable anything. <laughs> it's a challenge. Yeah, and then managing my own routine so that I've actually slept as well because no, I can't say to the other camp chef can you check a bottle sign every hour or the producer because yeah. they'll just look at me you've got to be comfortable yeah. well rested well fed uh, hydrated because I've still got to do the evac in the morning so had the river risen like it did when we were in the jungle yeah. a few months back had the river risen two metres overnight and it was uncrossable by canoe it would have just been too dangerous there was no helicopter landing site on the other side because of the tree canopy. You are now in a prolonged field yeah. care environment, up more than you were that day. Yeah. You could be looking at two, three days until the circumstances allow evacuation by another means. You either create an improvised helicopter landing site and hope for a gap in the cloud, or the river calms down and you're able to cross. That's where we're going to come on to the next podcast, prolonged field yes. care and some of the acronyms and the preparation and the considera- considerations. Yeah. But I, th- I think we, we've done this on the other podcast. If you plan for that, I planned for potentially not getting out for three days. I would have been pushing it, especially somebody with in major pain, or if I had two patients with pain, I'd be pushing it with what I had, but I could have managed... Remember, the aim is not to eliminate pain in the wilderness, it's to make it manageable. And I made... I could have made pain manageable for three days. I had enough supplies in the larger pack 
if I'd have lost that, I'd have used, used masking tape. That's key though, isn't it? it knowing your parameters, yeah. not just the expedition is going to be seven days, but it could be prolonged to ten days. Yeah. Coming down a mountain, if there's rock fall or a landslide or avalanche and you're blocked in for an extra week, you could be on exped for six weeks instead of five. Have you got enough supplies yeah. to manage that kind of patient when Murphy's Law kicks in for that amount of time? And, and also is explaining that to your supply system. Well, you're only going for three days. Yeah, but have you seen where we're going? What if? And this is why I justify I want to take X amount of this, X amount of this. But not too much, so yeah. it's too heavy to yeah. carry. And, and not, this is why I didn't, like my large, I say large pack for the camp, it wasn't really big because I didn't want to overtake. It was enough to comfortably look after one really, my worst case was either somebody falls out of the boat rolls down the rapids and then gets half eaten by a crocodile which is a kind of a serious trauma the other is going to be a dehydration rolls down the hill smacks the head so I had enough to manage pretty much two patients at that it had been a struggle not easy whilst trying to eat sleep drink myself I'd have probably ended up IVing myself <laughs> but I had enough to comfortably do two people of that severity for 48 hours or one person for a bit longer it had been challenging but I could have achieved it not and we're not talking we're not in a hospital we've not got lights nothing's clean uh, like all the gloves because of the humidity even though the gloves were sealed in bags and ziplock bags they were still full of water from yeah. because of the geographical change and the temperature changed, they'd gone through and aeroplanes and yeah, you get condensation. They were already wet before you even put them on. And to be honest, I used I only used my gloves when I took when I uh, removed the IV because I was sweating that much when I did the IV. <clears throat> as soon as I put them on, they'd like literally fill up the water. And it was just so difficult. So it was like, yeah, clean the area. I used hand gel made it as clean as I could and did it that but I only used in the end when I cooled down it was 3.30am there's no sun the humidity's gone it's raining it's nice and cold and that was the first time I was able to actually put a pair of latex gloves on and do anything with them before that it was just impossible first time you had half an hour's peace by the sound of things <laughs> yes <laughs> well that's fantastic Chris I appreciate the honesty and the humility and you know, nobody's perfect, nobody's an expert. That's why I say practice in medicine. We get better every time as long as we review it. I think there's an awful lot come out of this for our next expedition, but also for the institutional learning. We're going to debrief this with the medical director as well. And then hopefully some of the next podcasts we're going to look at will be anti-venom, um, point of care ultrasound, pre-hospital ultrasound, communications, a search and rescue operation that you and I did uh, to rescue a German tourist in, in the jungle not so long back, a UK mountain rescue situation, casualties in the Arctic in a prolonged field care environment, and in a high altitude mountain, along with the pre-hospital prolonged field care considerations that you almost entered into at this time. So there's some of the things we're going to talk about in the future. Um, in the meantime, if you've got any questions, comments or observations with regard to this podcast or the particular case study please feel free to fry them in we're always willing to learn and take more advice from the experts either for our own institutional learning or to share on the podcast you can get in touch with us through the facebook page sos servicios medicals or the website www.sosserviciosmedicals.com or the red med website www.redmed.education and hopefully in the next couple of weeks We'll have the Red Med Facebook up as well. On all of those platforms, we'll be sharing some of the templates that we talk about, like the pre-trip questionnaire, prolonged field care vital signs chart, and the risk assessment template. So hopefully they'll be of some help to you, and we'll keep adding stuff on as the podcast develops and the courses go. So as usual, it's been supported and sponsored by SOS Coffee, which is where we're heading now. So in the meantime, thanks very much, guys. All the best. Stay safe.